Ladies and gentlemen, once again, your BACC president, Pamela Ratliff. We hope you all enjoyed the breakout sessions you took part in this afternoon. And remember, if there is one that you missed, the sessions are being recorded and will be archived on our BACC website. Today has been a whirlwind and we appreciate you all joining us on this journey. As we near the end of our time together, we're grateful to have Dr. B.J. Miller with us to help us find meaning in this time of free fall in our lives and in the world. Dr. B.J. Miller is a longtime hospice and palliative medicine physician and educator. He's been on faculty at his alma mater, UCSF, since 2007 and has worked in all settings of care, hospital, clinic, residential facility, and home. Led by his own experiences as a patient, BJ advocates for the roles of senses, community, and presence in designing a better ending. He speaks nationally and internationally on the topics of death, dying, palliative care, and the intersection of healthcare with design. His 2015 TED Talk, not whether, but how, has been viewed over 10 million times. And his work has also been the subject of multiple interviews and podcasts, including Oprah Winfrey, PBS, The New York Times, The California Sunday Magazine, Goop, Krista Tippett, Tim Ferriss, and the TED Radio Hour. His book, A Beginner's Guide to the End, was co-authored with Shoshana Berger and published in 2019. BJ's latest project, Mental Health, aims to provide personalized holistic consultations for any patient, caregiver, or clinician who needs help navigating the practical, emotional, and existential issues that come with serious illness and disability. It is my pleasure to welcome to you Dr. B.J. Miller. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, as ever, I, I, these days, I, I'm sorry we're not physically together, um, but in some ways we are. And I'm very glad to be here with you guys today. So let's, um, I'm going to cut over to my slides <clears throat> and we will sort of walk through them. But let me just say before I do that, <clears throat> excuse me, the perp from, 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 from where I sit, the purpose of my uh, remarks and the slides are really trying to speak to all of us as human beings um, who dare to deal with life's inevitabilities, whether by cho choice or by force. Um, and so whether you're a patient or a family member or a professional caregiver, or I, I hope you'll find something in these slides, in these comments um, for yourselves. Again, I'm trying to speak to this denominator among us as we all try to find our way and feel our way. Okay, guys, and then hopefully we'll have some time for some Q&A and whatnot here too. So let me cut to the slides now. Okay, um, almost ready. Okay. Um, and I should say, I'm, <clears throat> I will, death will come up in my comments. Um, I don't mean to focus on it, but I mean to sort of try to cast a wide enough catchment for us all that uh, doesn't run away from anything, including that. So I'd like to include it in my comments, but I'm not trying to focus on it or, or push it on anybody. We all get to it in our own time. But I also offer that to, as a comment to say, <clears throat> You know, some of these, the subject is large and can be triggering for all of us, any of us. So uh, feel free to, all emotions welcome, and feel free to reject any of my statements too. Um, but here we go. So 
Um, this slide, this is just a still from the, from the film, The Seventh Seal, which is just one I very much love. It's a Bergman movie. And it's about how we basically bargain with death. You know, we always know we're going to lose that game on some level, but uh, yet we negotiate with it. We push and pull with it. We make it fuzzy. Um, sometimes it's something we wish for, or sometimes it's the last thing we wish for. So anyway, hence this slide. Now, I thought I'd <clears throat> kick things off really uh, quickly here with a definition of palliative care, which is my field. Um, and uh, it's, many of you guys will know this, and I don't mean to repeat things, but um, this definition, because palliative care gets conflated with end of life care or hospice so much, uh, it's really worth taking a moment to separate the two a little bit. Because palliative care, you don't need to be dying anytime soon to get palliative care. And a lot of people, um, if you think it's for end of life only, well, then you won't, you won't enable, you won't enlist with this kind of care that can be so, so helpful. And the common experience is that people wait far too long to welcome this approach to care into the mix. So let me just uh, let us read this slide here. This is the world health definition uh, of palliative care. No, oh, shut up. I think you guys all have it on your screen. You can read it yourselves. Hmm. Well, and maybe in case some of you guys are just listening, I'll read it too. So, <clears throat> palliative care is an approach that improves the quality of life of patients and their families facing the problems associated with serious illness through the prevention and relief of suffering by means of early identification and impeccable assessment and treatment of pain and other problems, physical, psychological, and spiritual. Now, we, won't, we could spend uh, an hour on this definition alone. I just want to point out a few things. That quality of life is the goal here. Um, patients and families are our unit of care. As we all know, this is a team sport. None of us goes through these things alone. And that the focus of the work really is around suffering. If there's, a, if there's a problem we're trying to address, it would be suffering, unnecessary suffering, versus the problems of disease per se. That's for the rest of healthcare. In palliative care, we focus on the experience of illness, and the experience of suffering. Um, <clears throat> and you can tell physical, psychological, spiritual, that is another way of putting whole person care or holistic care. Uh, I love, so you know, no, no mention of time here, no mention of death. Um, it's relevant if you've got you know, 50 years to live or five days to live. Uh, and that's really, really key. I'll probably mention it again in this talk. Um, and one more thing I love to point out about this definition is, um, wouldn't you think, you know, if I were a naive person just plopped in front of the screen here for the first time thinking about healthcare with not much experience with it, I would assume that this is a definition of healthcare. I would assume that this is what all of healthcare is meant to do. <clears throat> but alas, this is not the way healthcare is currently designed. Hence, we need a subspecialty, a sort of exotic field in medicine to reorient us back to these big and important and universal issues. Okay, I'll, I'll get off my soapbox now <laughs> and try to keep moving. Um, so suffering. Uh, what is it? You know, we all do it, but it's hard. It can be hard to define, yet it's a, about the most normal thing we can ever experience. I like to remember that the first thing a healthy baby, brand new human being does in this world is to cry, is to wail. I'm assuming there's some suffering behind that. And it's interesting that that would be our first step into the world. Um, so I, I like to define suffering as a gap in myself that opens up a gap or a wedge. <clears throat> the, the gap between the world I have, the reality I have, and the reality or world I wish for. <clears throat> we human beings have this thing called an imagination. And we can project ourselves into the future and in the past. It's quite a talent, but it can also run amok with us. Um, so I like that definition of suffering uh, because it's first of all, it's very normal, but that definition also gives us two things, our two basic responses. One is we can, we can try to change our reality, change, change the world, <laughs> very hard to do. 
Um, but that's one way to close that gap. The other way to close that gap would be to you know, sort of in a more Buddhist or contemplative fashion, which would be to quit wishing for things we can't have. That this endless desire for something that we don't have is the source of suffering on some level. So those, those give us our two ways to fill that gap. And I think most of us try to do a little of both. Um, so the last thing to say here is suffering is huge. And this is why our, my field is inherently interdisciplinary. Um, doctors, nurses, social workers, chaplains, volunteers, art therapists, music thanatologists. I mean, when the subject is quality of life, what, what isn't relevant? And that also begs the point that none of us, no one discipline or no one person has a lock on what it means to suffer or what it means to quell that suffering. This is why this field and the subject matter is so powerful is that it's not like doctor up here, patient down here. No, on, on this, in this realm, we all have something to offer. We all have something to learn. And the subject matter is a way of putting us all sort of side by side in that way, not one over or above the other. So the last thing to say here is this little point here, logistical suffering on the bottom right there. I throw in that word because I think it's important for us to be clear. And I, I wonder if anyone in the audience would fight me on this, but um, sadly, despite good intentions, the healthcare system itself can become uh, a source of the suffering rather than a source of the relief of suffering. That is sadly a common experience and is worth naming. So we all don't feel crazy on top of uh, in pain. <clears throat> so, you know, let's spend a minute there. Like, why? Why? One of my favorite three-letter words. I mean, I have a lot to say about this. But one, we could say, why do we have a healthcare system that, despite itself, uh, actually can do harm? Um, uh, but I also think this is a question that doesn't get asked enough among us providers. Like, why are we doing this? <laughs> why are we offering this treatment to someone? And similarly, from, as a patient, I, I need to remind myself to ask why, why, why am I here? Why this treatment? Why me? Why not me? These are also the questions of the existential uh, domain, which is so much a subtext of this talk, which is the pursuit of meaning in life. I don't think it's pretty, I don't, I don't think it's very controversial to assume that we all as human beings are interested in a meaningful life. Here again, entirely subjective. You know, this is also part of its power. We each get to say for ourselves what is meaningful. Um, and also, I think it's also interesting to reflect on whether is meaning something that exists and our job is to go find it, turn over rocks until we discover meaning, or does meaning is meaning an invention that we humans get to make up, that we get to place, we get to invest something with meaning? Um, that gets at a belief system, and I'd say both are welcome from where I sit. Uh, but I think it's also worth uh, sort of realizing, especially for us healthcare prof professionals, that I think existential distress is probably the most common complaint, if, if we're all, if we all have the language for it, that it ends up in any doctor's office, in any clinic. And that gets at this crisis of meaning. Why? Why me? Why this disease? So there's a lot to that question, but I also want to encourage each of us to ask ourselves this question when we're considering treatment um, or offering it. But let me circle and spend a little bit, a, a moment on this healthcare system. I think it's really uh, important to understand um, because the healthcare system, as we all know, is filled with people who really mean well, really care, go train for years and years, go into debt, all for the privilege of helping to care for another human being. It's a stunning, stunning uh, impulse. And to have a field, a system that revolves around that impulse is so gorgeous. And yet, and yet, we have this system that can cause harm, that can take us away from ourselves. So how do we get there? How do we get here? Why? <laughs> well, for me, this started in the mid 19th century. This is a painting depicting what's called Ether Day, the, the, the a day in 1846 in Boston at Massachusetts General Hospital where physicians harnessed the power of ether to put a person to sleep so we could operate on that person and they wouldn't feel anything. This is the the invention, the day anesthesia came into being. 
And you know, I thank God, right? I mean, I've had multiple surgeries and <laughs> uh, I am very grateful for this invention. But this marks the beginning, mid 19th century of when medicine and science are coming together and technology as well. It began this sort of scientific method of reductivism, of objectivity, uh, of reproducibility. Um, and this is this has served us well. This scientific method it's really it's it's, it's uh, it gotten us to many beautiful, amazing inventions. I myself, having uh, been a burn uh, patient, I'm alive because of this type of uh, this interpretation of medicine. But a hundred and ooh, 170, 80 years into this way of being, I think we also have to come to terms with the, the limitations of it. And in a nutshell, I think the idea here was, you can see, you, you can put a patient to sleep and in a way you get the person out of the way and you can muck on with their body. Uh, it's not always so literal as in a surgical procedure, but it, 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 you can feel it in the rest of medicine. If you've been a patient, you can be homogenized, genericized, named, labeled by your disease rather than your interests, your loves or your personality. And so <clears throat> this is how the, the system focused in some very reasonable way, but focused on disease. That that was our, that was the thing that we were meant to address in medicine. That's a slightly but importantly different statement than uh, let's focus on people who happen to be living with illness or disease. Um, I think you can feel this, that we have a system that focuses on disease, not so much on the people with disease. And that's just basically a design flaw. And hopefully if we get our way, we can uh, evolve. Because again, the healthcare system is something we made up. It's an invention. It's not something that nature made. So we can change it. Okay, so I'll, I'll get off that one. Um, I think we all get the point here about healthcare being a wonderful and horrifying thing. Um, now, some of these, the rest of these slides, guys, are sort of prompts, just provocations that, I, that come from my own experience and that seem relevant. And again, take or leave them. Um, Quality of life, that phrase that showed up in the palliative care definition and a phrase that most of us would be familiar with is a wonderful thing. Um, but I'm also um, aware of this sort of general disposition that this sort of statements like, if you have your health, you have everything. Um, first of all, what is health? Who gets to say? And is health just the absence of disease? That's the way we treat it. But I don't think that's, Either we need another word or that's not what health is. It's bigger uh, than that. Um, being whole, healing, et cetera. We'll get to that a little farther down the talk, but you know, I think there are things bigger than this notion of health. And sometimes we talk about quality of life as a consolation prize. Um, maybe some of us have heard like, oh, you know, I'm so sorry, Mr. Smith, we can't cure your disease, mm -hmm. but we can go for quality of life in this sort of uh, second place finish. Whereas I think if we stop and think about it, you know, why are you interested in having your health, whatever that is? I, I'm interested in having my health so that I can parlay it into a quality of life, so that I can navigate the planet, I can delight in the planet, participate in the planet, so I can be of service, um, these kinds of things. So I guess the point here is that from where I'm sitting, this idea of quality of life is the bigger thing, actually. It's not the consolation prize, it is the prize. And it's also meant for us, each of us to own this ourselves. Again, back to the subjective plane, our own opinion of things actually really matters. Another thing that comes up in healthcare in general is we talk about, uh, you know, suffering. And, uh, but most of us in the, end up in the healthcare system because something's gone wrong, you know. And our job on some level is to help make things less wrong, less horrible, less hard. And that's a wonderful big goal. I don't want to knock it. Um, but the truth is, I think we also need to keep an eye out where we can make life more wonderful, more amazing, where we can touch into life's mysteries and, and find some awe and reverence for this, this, this thing called life. Um, you know, when I'm working with students, sometimes you kind of, you know, we're learning all about molecules and what they do, but we never rarely take the time to ask ourselves, why is it so amazing to have molecules in the first place? Um, so trying to lift our gaze above the horizon line here and get into not just a harm reduction or less negativity and to something more positive. 
And lastly, I don't, I also want to make the point here that <clears throat> this is not a linear thing. It's not more wonderful or less horrible. Uh, I think those of us, if we reflect on our own suffering, we'll find a way to actually appreciate what suffering teaches us. And I don't think uh, a wonderful life is not one that's free from suffering. That may sound counterintuitive, but think about that. Think about how much you've learned from your own trials and tribulations and where you might be if you've never had any. Talk to a lot of very wealthy, very fortunate people who don't have a sense that they've suffered in some way and feel left out or feel part of the club. Um, so, I, you know, I wouldn't wish a lack of suffering on anybody, really. And too much too much good comes from it. Humility, curiosity, reverence, uh, effort, all sorts of good things. So it can do both. We can also, you know, making life more wonderful has something to do with addressing the suffering. They are related, not opposed. Uh, this is just a slide to remind ourselves of all the, the world beyond words. Um, I think we know, our, you know, the communication is the majority of good communication comes from body language, eye contact, nonverbal cues. Um, it's a it's a really important point because I think sometimes, especially around the subject that we're talking about, we, we talk about advanced directives and they're very, very important. Um, but it's all words. You know, there's if you can you, if you can state your wishes, well, then you have some some chance that your wishes will be followed. If you can't state your wishes, well, then, you know, tough. Um, you know, I, I feel like that's overly, like so many things in medicine, just overly reduced. Maybe all we have to work with from a logistical point of view, but maybe we can do better. Now, for example, I think about my patients or people I've known who are in advanced stages of dementia, for example, and who have found some way, somehow a feeding tube got placed. Um, and, you know, they're every day trying to pull the tube out. Isn't that a kind of communication? Um, and shouldn't we learn to revere the body and what it, what it communicates to. Okay, uh, so this is, uh, this is Florence Nightingale. And I just love to bring her up because <clears throat> she was also around at this time of the sort of scientific revolution, technological revolution, late 19th century, uh, when this idea that we could invent our way with enough work and labor, we could invent our way through every problem. We could solve things like death. Well, <clears throat> you know, if you read this book, still in print, it's interesting to see, despite that backdrop, what she pulls our attention to. She pulls our attention to things like uh, natural light in a room in a hospital, fresh cut flowers. She even talks about the floor wax she likes to use on her wards because it has a certain sheen and smell and feel. And what she's pointing us to is this, the world of the aesthetics, of aesthetics. Um, I, I love, this is my favorite, favorite subject, topic. Um, it doesn't often make its way into talk, conversations about health or healthcare, but if you think about it, it is huge. Uh, for starters, let's just define it. Aesthetics is not this, you know, uh, it's, it's come to mean prettiness. You know, aesthetic dentistry would be how to get white, straight teeth, and aestheticians are folks who help beautify our skin, et cetera. And that's great. Beauty is cool. I'm all for it. But um, the point here is aesthetics is much, much bigger. Aesthetics is just the felt world, the world of the, of the senses. There's no necessarily good or bad. It's just, do you feel it? What do you feel? What is the sensation? It's the world of perception. It is the world of the body. And after all, it is the body, this thing that is getting sick. It is the body that we will one day lose. So uh, sometimes we have this habit in the West of separating our minds from our bodies, et cetera. And we have a way of denigrating the body or trying to ram it into some smooth porcelain ageless thing, which is just not natural, of course. And that puts us at odds with our own reality. Rather, I think if we can sort of step back before the words, before the narrative, before the meaning making, before the adjective set up, if we could just feel if we can tend to the world of sensation, that has a way of really opening us up to the power of, of life in general, of being alive, being alive. I like to think that I, you know, I'm not, yeah, sure, I'm interested in being alive, but I'm, I'm really interested in feeling alive. And those things are different. Um, I think it's an important designation around what constitutes life. 
medicine left to its current devices would say, well, life is whether or not you have a heartbeat. I don't think that's quite uh, does the, system, the, the subject justice. So let's not uh, relegate aesthetics to pretty things or artwork, but rather something very mundane and daily, which is just the life of, 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 our, of our sensations. Go there. Well, one last point I'd like to point out, <laughs> this is actually this word is, if you remember this ether day painting, you know, that was the day that uh, anesthesia came into being, you know, and, and that's a, uh, the, anesthesia is a whole field in medicine. What is a, that is the antonym of aesthetics. That is, that is a pursuit of numbness. So here again, I think we can do better than pursue numbness. Here's a really important distinction, I think, for ourselves. Curing is a marvelous, wonderful eventuality, a wonderful thing when it's possible, you know. Um, but the problem, the problem is it's not always possible. And for some of us, it's not even desired. Uh, and, you know, as a disabled person, as an obviously disabled person, I've been on the receiving end of this kind of judgment that goes with this idea that people wanted to fix me and that because I wasn't fixable, my limbs had to go, they couldn't be saved. Uh, I was incurable. There's a, there's, a, there's a judgment that goes along with that. Um, and you can feel that in medicine. That's the moment of abandonment um, where medicine says things like, oh, I'm so sorry, there's nothing more we can do. Well, that's just plain not true. As fellow human beings, there's always something we can do, whether it's a hand on the shoulder, or shed a tear together, or just share some silence. Um, so caring is wonderful, but it doesn't, it can't get us, it can't, it, it can't be the full picture. And medicine, unfortunately, tends to stop there. That's why acute care is so well done in this country and chronic care, i.e. care around things that can't be cured has this short shrift feeling around it. Now healing, a uh, much different endpoint. Healing is much more self-referential. One can be whole and be dying. One can be whole and be sick. You can be dismembered like myself and be whole. It's a, it's a state of being, a way of being, a way of seeing. It's a perspective too. And it's bigger. It's a much bigger, better goal. And if healthcare, or never mind the healthcare system, if we together kept our goal healing or being whole, I think we'd all have a much more wonderful time working together and all sorts of things would feel possible and we would never uh, be asked to abandon one another. So let's maybe head for healing rather than uh, simply curing. I mentioned earlier that, you know, the power, the compulsion to find or make meaning is a powerful human enterprise. And I, I love it. We, we can inject meaning anywhere. You know, think about Viktor Frankl, a Holocaust survivor who wrote the book, Man's Search for Meaning. I highly recommend it. It's a, sort of a Bible in palliative care. Um, and he paraphrases Nietzsche, who said something like, you know, a, a, a person can withstand any how as long as he has a why. So here again, back to this existential point. If you have a, a purpose, a why, why am I doing this? It's a, that is a, a real power. There's a momentum that comes with that. Um, and beautiful. So let's help each other find or make meaning at every turn. And I want to also put a plug in for the world uh, that, when, you know, that there's value in life and to ourselves, even when we cannot find or place meaning. I know for myself, there are moments where I just can't find any meaning to the moment. I just can't get there. Does that mean I'm less than or don't deserve life or can't find value in life? Hmm? No, of course not. In fact, meaninglessness is a very powerful place. Meaning requires a narrative, a story. Um, you know, that's another thing I love about this, the world of the senses, the aesthetic plane. Well, I don't need any time and I don't need a story to feel something. Again, back to think of our of brothers and sisters living with dementia, you know, who can't string together, can't ha, don't, don't have the executive function to put together a, a, a sense of purpose or meaning, um, but they can feel things. So this awful also sort of the idea of this aesthetic domain and, and, and a reverence for, for, for purposelessness allows for us to sort of eke more out of this life and to see value beyond our meaning. I just make, I want to make a plug for that state too. 
rel uh, related here. This is my placeholder slide for mystery. So <clears throat> sometimes I, you know, there's <laughs> the smartest person at this conference, I'm sure would tell us that, you know, we don't know everything. You know, there's a lot we don't understand. And that is not, that's not ignorance. That's, uh, that can be an embrace of, of mystery. I mean, think about looking up in the night sky and just trying to reckon with this crazy reality that we, even the empirical reality, never mind the things we can't see or prove or know. Um, but even the things that we do know is powerful. We can't necessarily understand and explain them. Uh, and that's a gorgeous, vaunted state. And if each of us, if our goal is to live until we die, and maybe even through our deaths, who knows? Well, we, I, I would encourage us all to have some relationship to mystery, and especially those of us who want to sit with someone all the way to the end and go stare into that abyss together. You better have some relationship with not knowing, because knowing by itself, it ain't going to get you all the way there. So find a way to get comfortable with mystery, even be interested in it, and you will forever be interested in life and death. Um, let me just check the time here. I know I can ramble. Um, okay, I'll try to speed it up here a little bit, guys. Um, so these slides, I, I want to just, these are fun visuals for me anyway. I think sometimes the thing that we should do, be working on for ourselves and for each other, is this human talent of, of making perspective. It's related to making meaning, but it's a more it has to do with not so much what we're seeing, but how we see. And the art world has a lot to offer us here. You know, focusing on focusing on your role as the as the viewer, you can change reality by changing how you see it. It is a shocking talent. I'm not sure if other species have it. Um, it may be my favorite human talent, and certainly the, I think the most useful. I mean, we can all look at the same thing from different angles and find different value in a different meaning, etc. So to make the point here, like look, here's a shot of the Earth from the atmosphere, right? One thing, we're looking down on earth is one thing. We are all part of this one thing. We are all one. That's just true. Look, you can see it, right? This, zoom out, uh, and then you can see that we are one of um, gazillions, right? That's also true, you can see it. And you can zoom in, and here, here are virus particles under an electron microscope that our bodies are littered with <laughs> virus, bacteria, um, so even this one thing that is my body, it constitutes a gazillions of life forms. Um, so also true, also observable. Um, so none is more true than the other. It just depends on where we place our lens. And that capacity for us to place our lens gives us a sense of agency and can allow us to be more than just our illness and reframe ourselves in the world, reframe what illness means to us. We have that power as human beings. And I think it's probably underutilized in healthcare. A couple more to go here, guys. This one I just love as it just points us to what I have come to see as maybe the most important job. I don't know, I keep saying things like that. I'll stop. It's a very important job, which is for us to bear witness for one another. Um, we can feel so darn isolated when we're sick, so alone, so unseen especially even when surrounded by people in the healthcare setting who are seeing our disease, but not us, as we've said. And for all of us, provider or patient alike here, it's just, I wish that early on, I wish my teachers had teased out this distinction, that we human beings see contrast, we see differences, and it's a, it's a power we have, it's a good thing. We see light and dark, and they need each other to, to frame each other, they're foils. So we have this incredible power to discern distinct uh, differences. So, but, and we, we humans tend to do this extra step, which is we often will then lay our judgment on top of those distinctions. We value, I do, I keep doing in this talk, I keep wanting to say, this is the most important, therefore other things are less important. It's just this weird compulsion we humans have, oftentimes innocent enough, but oftentimes very hurtful. Um, you know, think about the times where you've been, I hope each of us before we die gets to a moment where someone actually really, really sees us. Maybe it's a, a dog. I know I live with a dog who, who, I think she really, really sees me, but I don't think she judges me. And that's a really powerful difference. One is in the name of healing and uh, accompaniment and companionship. 
and reverence for one another and reflecting off each other, a beautiful, beautiful thing. And the other can be a horribly, powerfully, uncomfortable, demeaning thing. And it all has to do with this value that we project onto things. So let's hold up our talent for discernment and really hold this, this penchant for judgment with some amount of suspicion, especially when we're concerned uh, around something like healing. Here too, I just want to say that one of the things that, you know, the self, uh, the ego, uh, we all, especially in this country, we love autonomy, independence, you know, but, uh, you know, the truth is that we are all, we are all uh, in this plane, we are all the dying. There's a rhetorical, there's a trick that people do, we humans do, when we put the in front of something and Heidegger used to write, Heidegger wrote about this. It's a tell. So if you say the homeless, the poor, the dying, you are saying that I'm not, I'm not that. I, I may care about the poor, but I am not of the poor. Similarly, we say the dying. I care of the dying. Well, it, that's care of ourselves too. We should include ourselves in that equation um, for all sorts of reasons. Perhaps chief among them are importantly is that we don't accidentally, casually separate ourselves from each other. That's where so much of suffering creeps in. It's the gaps we set up for ourselves and for each other. These false distinctions between ourselves. And in some ways, we are all connected, even if we can't prove it, I believe. And in some ways, we need each other, which gets me to this slide. This I learned when I became disabled. This idea of independence. Let's just level set here, guys. Let's, <laughs> I like to remind myself and point out with students, uh, there is no such thing as independence. You know, we talk about it as though it's everyone's goal, especially in the, in, in the US. Uh, no one, I think there should always be an asterisk next to that word. That like objectivity can be an aspiration, a state you head for, but you will never attain it. As a human being, you will not obtain, obtain objectivity. You cannot remove yourself from the picture. Similarly, you are never gonna reach a state where you need nothing from nobody. There is not a person on this planet who has needed no one on some level, big or small. So I think it's a really important point because those of us who are sick or are, uh, are uh, disabled, we are losing our independence. And that may, there's something re very real about that. But I think it's, uh, it's important for us to level set and remind each other that you're never, no one is ever fully independent. And no one is never fully dependent, really. We're all on this spectrum. And when I became disabled, I felt I had to leave the world of the independent people and go over to the world of the dependent people. Like it was this, you know, I was relegated to some other place. And that's because of our man-made structures. That's before the Americans with Disabilities Act. And you couldn't rely on a fabric of society to make a place for you. That makes me very, very sad. And this is one of the ways we uh, suffer more than we need to. So maybe we can remind ourselves and each other that you know, we're all on this spectrum of dependence, of independence. We just move up and down in a millimeter here or there of relative independence or relative dependence. I like this because it's helpful to remind ourselves you don't have to fall so far because becoming sick or disabled doesn't mean you have to leave this world and go to another one. It's the same darn world. Last slide. Um, yeah, last slide. Um, this is a painting by Nicholas Poussin, 17th century. And I, I like to end talks on this one. I just find it very compelling. But, you know, every spiritual tradition, Poussin was very much a Christian man and comes from the Judeo-Christian tradition. Um, but every religious tradition, faith tradition, will on some level deal with death and will some level make the point that we are all connected. And some level will try to bring the, the death into the realm of life. So this is a painting called Et in Arcadia Ego. I too dwell in paradise. That's what that means. I too exist in paradise. That's what you see this tomb sitting in the middle of the screen here. And you can't really read it, but there's an inscription on the tomb that says Et in Arcadia Ego. And these, you know, these wandering happy hikers cruising around paradise stumble on this tomb and look at this goddess figure, maybe Minerva, I'm not sure who this is, but they're looking at her pointing this inscription with fascination. What is, what do you mean I too exist in paradise? What is a, what is a sarcophagus doing in paradise? 
And one way to interpret this in many ways, of course, it being a painting, but one way to interpret this would be to say that the I here is death because it's written in the active present tense. It's not the past tense. It's not a memorial. It's not I was here. Uh, it is I am here. And making the point that maybe death is not this antithesis of life, this robber of life, but a part of life. And that is a really important frame shift. Um, here again, we don't have to, we're, in some level, we're never leaving the realm of the living, even when we're dying. We live on in the way the residues, the emotional and psychological residues we've left behind. Our body keeps going. If we let we put it in the ground, it'll become other life forms. You know, you start looking at death and it becomes hard to define what the heck it is. But one way or another, I think, for our, all, for our sanity's sake, we need to find a way to craft a worldview for ourselves that includes everything that we go through so that we're not at odds with our own reality, even and in including death. So, all right, guys, that is the end of my prepared comments. So um, let's see here if I can come out. There we go. Great. So. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Miller. That was a really insightful, provocative talk. Hmm. Um, gives us so much to think about. It's my pleasure. Um, to the audience, if you have any questions for Dr. Miller, please enter them into the Q&A box. Um, looks like we have one just that just came through. It says, a person may have lost the tip of their finger, another is battling a terminal disease, yet both appear to sim similarly equally distraught, demonstrating how relative one person's pain is to another's. As a caregiver, it can sometimes be difficult to come to terms with this. What would you suggest? Mm. Thank you for that point. It's really, really key. And here again, I'll, I'll, I'll wed a couple of the points from the talk, which is be very careful when you find yourself, I do it, <laughs> believe me, I do it uh, too. But when you find yourself comparing your suffering, suffering is a sort of self-contained experience. Uh, I, 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 uh, my own suffering is my own. And I've had the good fortune in a way of having some extreme losses like the loss of limbs from my injuries. Um, and, you know, and the loss of my sister, you know, the two biggies in my life. Um, but when I step back and I'm thinking about it for a second, I, I, I was similarly upset. I've been similarly upset when I've lost goldfish when I was a kid, when I've lost car keys at this the wrong moment, when I've lost just about anything. So th there is something generic about loss. Loss is loss. It's just coming up against this thing that this reality we wish were otherwise. It can be big or small. And I, I'd ask us all to resist the urge to judge that suffering um, because it feels, feels terrible to be on the receiving end. I've had my pain question before. I've had people suggest that you know, that my, my suffering is bigger than theirs and therefore they don't have uh, the rights to complain. Well, no, no, no. As of that, we're making it, there's a great example of unnecessary suffering where we accidentally uh, make it harder on ourselves than we need to. Let suffering stay in the subjective realm. Own it for whatever it is. Big, small, doesn't matter. Those are comparative terms. Just be with it, whatever the heck it is. Loss of a fingertip, a hangnail, car keys, period. If, if you can find your way to there, you will find your way to compassion in a much bigger way. And you also find yourself in a position where you won't judge yourself so harshly. Why am I so upset? My patients have much harder than me. Why is, what's my problem? And then I just start hating myself on top of suffering. It's a dead end. Thank you for that. And then we have a question about finding balance and focusing on life or death. And especially um, as cancer survivors or patients, mm -hmm. it seems that people are very uncomfortable talking about death. It sure does. And that's why I try to, you know, that's why I bring it into these talks, almost no matter what the subject is. Um, and I think and this is why I'm so grateful for a conference like this uh, and to be welcome in to, to having a, pro a provocative conversation. I think this is on all of us. Um, you know, the thing about death that's so amazing to me uh, is that it is, everything is included. You know, there isn't, death doesn't have any judgment. 
there's not, you know, some people get in, some people get out. There's no inside outside. Everything is welcome. And I think that's a really powerful truth. Um, in a way, uh, there's something to aspire there for all of us. So it's not, you know, versus the rest of life, death is not something you can fail at. And that's one of my favorite things. Are, we are all innocent before it. So I think it's really important that each of us find a way, again, to try to craft a view of the world or reality that includes death so that we're not cut up, so part of our lives, our existence isn't left out of the picture. So casually talking about it when it's your own, thinking about it with family and friends and loved ones, advanced care directive is a nice sort of conversation starter, a way, an excuse into this conversation. But you can, you know, talk about it in a gazillion ways. You know, here we are in autumn with leaves falling. What is that? That's death. You know, the tree, the leaf has died, it's falling to the ground, it's gorgeous. You start opening your eyes to this, you see death everywhere, right all alongside life. And you start making the point, you start realizing that the two come together, it's a package. And in this way, you can kind of begin to get used to the idea. I'm not asking that we have to embrace death, but maybe we can find a way. The real kind of wrote a beautiful letter about finding a way to love life so much and without picking or choosing that we include death in our, view, in, in our love. And I think that's a beautiful goal. And even a selfish one. I don't, you know, everyone can do what they want around this, but I'm, I, that's an aspiration for me personally. That's great. Um, can you talk more about palliative care and how and when it might make sense to access it for either yourself or for a family member? Yeah, thank you for that good question. You know, as I said in the start, palliative care has a real messaging, has a real branding problem uh, and a lot of us are trying to find a way to, to articulate this field so that we don't abandon end-of-life issues but nor do we scare people off that that's all we that's all we care about um so you know uh i think all of us that's why i kind of want to deputize all of us to spread the word about what pad of care is it doesn't that includes death but it's not concerted around death and again, that World Health Organization definition, the Center to Advanced Palliative Care, CAPC.org, has a good definition. CMS, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, have a wonderful definition of palliative care. So I'd re re let's remind each other that the, the ticket to deserve palliative care is, are you struggling in some way that you don't think you need to? Are things harder than they need to be? Period. Uh, and if, that's, if the answer is yes, well, then get help. We all need help. There's no shame in that. So that's one comment. Otherwise, more, you know, it gets a little tricky because um, that's the idea, the aspiration of palliative care. But as a field, we have a long way to go to develop. We don't have a workforce large enough trained in this kind of care to attend to the current needs, let alone the, the needs of an aging population. So yeah, you might turn on and tune into palliative care and then go try to find them in your home system and can't, can't get it even when you're looking for it. Um, so, so it's a little tricky. Uh, more tactically, I'd point you to a website, getpalliativecare.org, where you can type in your location and can find palliative care programs in your area. It also gets at why I started Metal Health, M-E-T-T-L-E, metalhealth.com. I don't mean to plug it, but just come see us there. The point, the reason why we started this in this uh, format was you don't need a doctor's referral. And then the online space, you can be anywhere. So you're not so it's a way to make this kind of care uh, more accessible. Um, but back to, I think the root of the question would be, don't overthink it. If you're suffering or as a caregiver or as a patient more than you think you need to, communications issues, whatever it is, and ask about palliative care. Let them tell you it's not time. But again, the norm is to wait too long, never too soon. Thank you for those resources. Um, we have an audience member who would like to know if you've written any books, and I know that you have, because we have a few in the BACC library, but if you wouldn't mind mentioning their titles, it might be helpful. Uh, I'm sorry, Erica, can you repeat that question? Oh, yeah, um, so we have an audience member who would like to know if you've written any books, and I know mm. that you have, but if mm -hmm. you wouldn't mention, uh, wouldn't mind mentioning some of the titles, that would be great. Sure, yeah. I did write a book. Glad that is done. Uh, that came out la last year, uh, called A Beginner's Guide to the End. 
And that is exactly what it sounds like. And my, my co-author Shoshana Berg and I wrote this book. It's uh, 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 around the basics of, of thinking about approaching one's death, either as a patient or as a caregiver. It's meant to cover the fundamentals, the basics. So there's that book. Um, I'm I, I do think it can be very helpful. Um, so again, a beginner's guide to the end. Simon & Schuster is a publisher. You can find it on just about anywhere. Um, so that's that. That's the only thing I've written. I've written some articles, uh, two I recently put out on aesthetics uh, that were rewrites of older things I did. And I've just posted those on medium.com, the sort of online portal um, for publishing just about anything. Uh, and then I, there was a, something, an article I did with CNN a while back and there's been a few other things out there, but that's my one book. And I will say a couple other books to love, um, Man's Search for Meaning, the Victor Franco book, uh, Francis Weller, The Wild Edge of Sorrow, I think is a very useful book on grief. Uh, Franco Staseski's The Five, in uh, Five Invitations, I think could be a very useful book around this subject. There are many others, but those are a few to name. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and here is what I would think is a tough question, but maybe it's not for you since you contemplate these things all the time, but when people ask you, what is the meaning of life? How do you respond? <laughs> I do just that. I chuckle <laughs> and, I, and I say, I don't know, but here's some thoughts. Here's what I think, you know, I don't think anyone gets to be the keeper of this, but for me, I think for me, I find a useful sort of gestalt statement is the meaning of life is to love and it's sort of that simple and that hard and I mean love like really love not 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 just the, not the easy stuff the hard stuff too and sort of why I keep trying to frame this view of reality that includes suffering and death and the hard stuff too um, so that we're not at odds with ourselves and and I also I like to remind myself and others how hard it is to to be loved in particular. I think most of us, many of us can find a way to loving something. I think it's actually harder to be loved. That, that is, and love needs that. It needs to be an exchange. It needs to go in all directions to, to feel real, to be realized. So for me, the meaning of life has something to do with that. And I do find that to be the answer to just about any issue, any problem that I've ever come across. Beautiful, thank you. Um, we have a somewhat related question. Can you sum up some practical ways to start trying to find meaning? Yeah, practical ways to find meaning? Yeah. At this point? Yeah, well, I think there are spiritual traditions and philosophical traditions to help you get there. I mean, there, this, is, this is as old as humanity. So this is, these are not new issues. So you can study the ancients, uh, the classics, um, so the world of philosophy, the world of religion, um, I would point you there. Um, for me, I like it. I, I'll point us back to this aesthetic domain and, and seeing ourselves as, as meaning, finding or meaning making either way requires a sort of, requires some time and, and, a, and an intellect to kind of string things together to form that meaning, whether it's a narrative. Essentially, it's almost always, to my mind, to be a, a, a narrative that we put together a story that we find and meaningful. Um, so in, just before we start setting about finding or making that meaning, I think it's really powerful to feel things first. You know, I think in the West, our, we have the sense that our bodies are here to serve our minds, that we are, that we are mind, that we are our intellects. Uh, and this, our bodies, this pesky thing that ages and gets in the way and we trip over. Uh, I have found it very useful when people who have been doing this, think about this thing much longer than myself, have pointed out this idea that the mind is here to serve the body. The mind is part of the body and that it serves the body. I love that reframe. I find that very, very useful. So the truth, Nietzsche wrote about this idea that there's no, no more reliable portal. We have no more reliable access to the truth than our senses. They don't lie. And so it can be a way to, not, not everything we think is real. Don't believe everything you think is one of my favorite bumper stickers. So 
here again, get in touch with your sensations, your feelings, the raw material of life from which you can find or make meaning. Spend some time in that plane, in the raw material plane, our thoughts, our feelings, our sensations. And then with a little bit of time, you can set up meaning from there. But first feel it. Um, and you'll realize how the mind really is here to serve the body. Very interesting perspective. Um, I think this is the last question that we have. And then we also have several um, comments that are praising your presentation. So I encourage you to read those after the session um, in the Q&A box. But the last question we have is regarding um, how do you deal with guilt? Um, mm. This audience participant is dealing with guilt after a loss of a parent who they weren't able to properly care for because they were going through cancer treatment. Mm. Oh, my friend, yeah. Well, thank you for daring to make that comment. Guilt is one of those things, it feels like shame. It can be obnoxious, so obnoxious that we even, it's hard to even own up to. I mean, I like to think of guilt, regret, shame, they, they exist, they, they're real. Um, we all experience them, many of us do anyway. I, I'm, a, I'm a regret machine. I, I can't believe how much time I spend thinking about my regrets. In fact, I start most days itemizing my regrets from the day before. It's a, I do it so naturally, and it's related to this question of guilt, that, uh, that I have to honor it as a thing. It's an impulse, so it's, it's, it exists. Okay, I'll deal with it. So what is it, so maybe you can start with, what is it trying to tell you? So feeling guilty, well, what is it trying to tell you? Well, maybe in this case, it's trying to, to somehow help you metabolize the limitations of this, of this one life, that we can't be multiple places at once, and there's only so much we can do, and there are only so many hours in a day. And so maybe guilt, like regret, is this, this thing that helps us learn or see beyond ourselves on some level, care about the world outside of ourselves, feel some sense of responsibility to it. But I hope ultimately with enough time that they also lead us to a much higher human capacity. And probably my favorite human capacity is the capacity to forgive. It is, it's so gorgeous and so necessary, especially for ourselves. I'm working on that one all the time. So, and I also will say this idea of guilt. Well, why do you feel guilty? Well, in part because you loved your parents. You know, if you didn't care about your parents, you didn't care. It's like grief. You wouldn't, there's nothing to feel guilty about. You wouldn't feel grief. There's nothing to worry about. So this, this compulsion, maybe this high, this inefficient sort of diesel fuel that, it get, that it forces us to see outside of ourselves, forces us to try to keep learning from our experiences. But I'd also push you on one more point. Is it guilt or is it grief that you're feeling? You know, because my Lord, what could you have done more? And even if you have an answer to that, well, I could have done X, Y, and Z. Well, it, that's in the past. And what would your parents say to you? So on all this fun, so grief, if we don't understand and don't see it for what it is, we end up getting stuck on things like anger and guilt, because those are just proxies for grief. Maybe your body's just trying to tell you how much you love your parents and how much you miss them. And maybe you can learn to kind of stop your mind there. Wonderful. Thank you once again for sharing all of your insights. I think this uh, was a beautiful way to end our day here. Mm. And um, I'd like to thank the audience for staying with us throughout the day. I hope you all enjoyed the 